how do you, how, what's the difference in the way you feel after sitting for 45 minutes? Any different? You feel different? Hmm? Brad does, he's nodding. What? You're sleepier and... <clears throat> calmer. Calmer. How many people feel calmer after you sat for 45 minutes? Oh my. Travis was, his eyes were burning, so you were ready to, right? So, so did that, did you, uh, so did that kind of, did you get a little energy, a real, real little renewed energy? Yeah, definitely. And it makes me feel slower. Slower? Like things aren't happening as quickly, like my mind, and things are happening at a slower rate. That's interesting, isn't it? That things aren't happening as quickly. That's an interesting concept, isn't it? Things aren't, right? They aren't happening because the slower your mind is, the slower things are happening, period. I think it's because something happened and then I'll think, 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 and then something else happens and it seems like they happened right next to each other almost. So afterwards, it's like something happens and there's space. I had the, the, just as we were ending, I thought, mm, I was going back at the way I felt when I came back from the airport, you know, and I thought, I, it's really amazing. I couldn't quite, I couldn't imagine feeling much better than, and yet I do. And it's, it's, it's um, always, I find it, it's just uh, an enigma to me that the mind can't remember that. It's just an enigma. It can't remember that, right? I'm always surprised. After all these years of sitting, I'm always surprised that it feels good. It's amazing. Uh, so um, I did. I actually so I said that about the having some guests. So I, I went to Whole Foods and got lots and lots of food. But one of the things I got was this um, pumpkin cheese, and they were experimenting with a new cheese, and so. So that she, I tasted it, and so I got some, and so I brought it for us, and so we'll have. I brought some crackers, so before we, you know, make sure you have some pumpkin cheese, on. okay? <laughs> and then we've got these little round things. I don't know what they are. What they're not? Are there tangerines or tan? What is that? Is it? Is it a tangerine? We we'll call it citrus. It's called what? <laughs> citrus. Citrus. <laughs> oh yeah. Citrus what? Well, someone's uh, my friend said from Dallas. She said it does start with a C, but she wasn't thinking of citrus. But anyway, all right. Well, I'm ready. Are we ready for the cheese now? <laughs> John. John was um, John descended into a deep, dark hole. And I guess it was, you know, like, did you take, like, some Prozac to get out of that? I mean, antidepressant? No. Our exchanges were very good. And I, <coughs> it wasn't that deep or dark, but... <clears throat> but I also was reading Sound of Silence by Sumedho, which was very good. And, oh, yes, I went... Oh, the deep, dark hole. Yes, I went to Minnesota and yeah, descended down to the mine. But you're speaking metaphorically. So. <laughs> so you've got to be so careful with these people, right? They're so lame. Yeah, I mean, I just you would email me that you were going into this deep uh, mine, and I thought that was fascinating. Uh, so um, I'm just going to talk. I don't. Uh, I really. Um, I, I said last week that we would do the uh, fourth foundation of mindfulness because we did that yesterday, and so I wanted. I said we would repeat it, but. I, I don't know if we will or not. Um, so we have two people from the beginners course who joined us today. It's just so happy that We're would back. you will you they're, they're back. Tell, will you introduce yourself? Uh, yes, my name is Barbara Ford, and this is my husband Roger. Are you her husband? Yes. Yeah. I does he agree to that? Are you? Her? <laughs> so I'm very glad that you all came. Thank, welcome. Right, so maybe uh, these people are very snotty. So, right, I mean, they could, you can leave, they won't even come up to you and say hello, so. I must say the 45 minutes, that was long for us. Yeah, oh yeah. yeah. 
I mean, we are, the most we sat, <laughs> yesterday we sat for 20 minutes, and that was the most that we had sat of the six weeks. And so I, you know, I was, when I saw you all coming out, I was like, oops. But it was, it was good. I mean, it was long, but I felt kind of refreshed. Actually. Good. Uh, even good. though I was, you know, obviously wanting, but still. Mm -hmm. And was this? Well, you know, I started to nod out a little bit. I had to, you know, get myself perked up and try to sit straight and try to not nod out. Barbara noticed, she said about three weeks ago, maybe four weeks ago, she commented that she had discovered that her mind can only concentrate for one second, right, at a time. I thought that was insightful. Um, so yesterday, I just want to share a few things, and um, we were talking about why it is for some, easy for some people to almost immediately when they start sitting and then for other people it's more it takes longer and so then i saw then over on two other people were talking and um, a young woman said something that i found so fascinating i made a noise <laughs> she said, oh. and then she said that um, she and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the young man they were both talking about, he actually said something about, he said that he had, after the sixth week, there were moments when he was having no thought. I mean, that the thoughts would go away. You know, I thought that was brightening, right? But, and he said it, but it's like the, the thoughts kind of subside. I think it was Gilbert. And he said that the thoughts were kind of subside, and then he just sees colors. And, and then he said, and he found that very uh, somewhat disconcerting and actually a little fright frightening. So uh, then she uh, agreed that, uh, you know, she said she had discovered that there was a level uh, of in sitting that there's something kind of scary about it. You know? So I said, well, what would that be? And she said this wonderful thing. She said, you know, she said, even though there are parts of myself that I don't like, she said, I don't want to change them. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? I said, you have, just, you have just verbalized the universal resistance to meditation, right? Even though there are parts of myself that I really don't like, I don't want to change them. Um, and I thought, I, what I really admired about that was the honesty. Right, I mean that was that was really honest to say that because I think a lot of us who come, you know, say, "Oh, I really want to change. I want to change something." But uh, how uh, often are we really interested in changing who we are? We want to change aspects, right? I want to change. I want to. You've heard me say this before. I want to improve my function, right? Have a better sex life, or not drink, or or be able to concentrate better, or be more calm, right, or be more successful. I mean, really, I mean, to improve our function, uh, that's a kind of a universal desire, but then when it comes to this idea that <clears throat> maybe, you remember like three weeks ago I suggested to everybody that the fundamental question maybe that we could ask ourselves is, I mean, this is the fundamental question, am I suffering? And it's not a question I don't think anybody wants to ask. I don't want to ask it. Not really. Um, am I wrong? I mean, it's like, I think it'd be okay to say, well, am I uncomfortable, right? Or am I dissatisfied? But I mean, but if the Buddha, if, you know, the Buddha said that the universal condition of, of having the uh, clinging to this idea of me is you're bound to suffer, I'm bound to suffer. I mean, it's kind of a basic thing, then you say, oh, well, am I suffering? So anyway, <clears throat> the, um, it, it seems to me that th th to have a really um, strong intention to say, I want to change, I, it seems to me that would have to be connected to that first noble truth of suffering that you'd have to say, I, I don't, 
I believe that it's possible not to suffer, to be free of suffering. And I, I, and I understand the price of that, the cost of that would be to change, to transform from that. So uh, the reason why that's all kind of a setup for <clears throat> the um, ever since the uh, certainly the two thousand years at least. I mean, you, we don't really how how far back the the four foundations of, of mindfulness really go. It's not really clear. <clears throat> As some of you know, I, I am convinced that the fourth noble truth, I mean the fourth uh, foundation of mindfulness was uh, sort of, is like an add-on, <clears throat> and it's a logical add-on, but it, it's quite um, unclear what the intention of it was. And it's very um, not typical of the Buddha's rather elegant and clear writing. So, but anyway, so I, I just wanted to finish up that since we were talking about it last week, and so you all already heard me talking about it yesterday. But I guess one of, I wanted to say, first of all, that is that the, uh, certainly in the South Asian countries, in Sri Lanka, and Thailand, and Burma, in, in those countries, the, the four foundations, or the four establishments, or it's also called the four abidings of mind, abiding in mindfulness in these four areas <clears throat> is uh, according to the Buddha is the direct path to change change absolute change not improvement <laughs> he did not say it's the direct path to improving your life right improving you know your attitude or improving your uh, he said it's the direct and he didn't say change by the way obviously he said liberation but if liberation is not equanimous with, I mean, it's synonymous with change, right? <clears throat> so, so that's, it's really interesting. Uh, so that is the core teaching of what you might call the Southeastern Asian countries is the, the absolute uh, attention to and practice of the four abidings of mindfulness. If you go to uh, the Tibetans, uh, I understand that the, the, it was, the Satipatthana Sutra was never translated into Tibetan um, Vajrayana. I don't think it was. Although they now, uh, you know, the Dalai Lama talks quite a bit about it. But, uh, but it's, in other words, the, the four foundations, abidings or steps of mindfulness, they definitely locate, you know that you're talking about Theravadan Buddhism or the, uh, you're talking about early Buddhism when you're talking about that. And if you go, you know, like you could work with a Zen teacher <clears throat> and work in an entirely different way. Uh, they, they do honor the idea of mindfulness and work with it, but they don't work with the, the, this linear and elegant uh, teaching of the four abidings. So I just wanted, I think it's important to realize that, that other disciplines or traditions don't work with the four abidings of mindfulness. <clears throat> and the the old, the, the really probably the oldest tradition does, I mean, pretty much. So, um, <clears throat> so I, I I wanted to just kind of emphasize uh, again that the practice of the the practice of the four abidings of mindfulness. It's really, it's about change. It's about tremendous internal change. It's not about, I don't know, I mean, there's this sort of like, you know, like there's all of these uh, psychological groups now, depressed people, there's a mindfulness for depression and mindfulness <laughs> for post-traumatic stress. Well, I mean, really, I mean, I really, I don't think I'm making fun of maybe. <laughs> I never know for sure. But I mean, but I mean, we've now we're really psychologizing mindfulness tremendously, right? Because we've found we have discovered it's very useful, right, in terms of uh, anxiety disorders, and it's very, and certainly uh, in terms of uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Very, those you know, mindfulness to, and for instance, the sensations in the body, the feeling tone. So that's not to put it down, but I mean, it certainly ain't what the Buddha was talking about, right? because it is, as I said, it's talking about 
I'll just use the expression, radical change, radical change in your life. So that you, you know, I mean, if you are beginning to let go of this idea of clinging to me, I don't want you all clinging to me any longer. Oh, I mean, to, I guess I should say clinging to you, right? If you let, if, if, we're, if we're letting go of this clinging to I am, right, which actually says this is mine, you can't say I am, I mean, if you say I am, the next thing you say is this is mine, right? These are my clothes, right? These are my clothes. These are my socks. Does anyone notice they're very plain today? Okay, so, I mean, that's, that's radical. That's absolutely radical and not um, absolutely um, um, rather alien to uh, um, our own uh, Western way of approaching and I, you know, I, and it's not clear uh, how, I, I, what it really means ultimately, but I'll get to that. So, so I just wanted to, uh, so that I have a kind of a different take on the fourth foundation of mindfulness, at least in my experience of sitting and listening to Dharma talks for many, many years. The tendency is, you know, there's the, there's the description of it, as you all know, the description of the four foundations. There's one passage where, where uh, supposedly the Buddha talks about it as the four pastures, right? That there are four pastures that you can roam in, your natural habitat. If you right, think of yourself as a right, farm animal, right? But there's four, you know, there's the left. What is it they say in, was in Dallas, out in the left fork and the right? What did they say in the movie? I mean, the Dallas... Out on the left, what was it? North Forty. So anyway, yeah. So anyway, there's, uh, there, but there are. It, that's a most pro, uh, common uh, expression. Uh, it's actually in the in the Satipatthana Sutra, I think. But anyway, the four pastures, the pasture four, and that would be the four foundations. So that's a very linear, if you think about it, right? Going from this pasture to that pasture to this pasture. To pasture. But I think that the uh, way, the, the, the correct way to, uh, to um, um, internalize this as a practice is to see that it is, to use Shinsen Young's wonderful expression, he used to say, subtle is significant. I always love that. It's very smart. He's a very smart man. Uh, the truth is, each uh, abiding is 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 a is a more subtle layer, and and the reason why one of the reasons why I'm entirely I'm totally uh, I'm, excuse me I'm just, I'm going to say all sorts of strange words entirely totally because my mind is gone. In yoga, I've always loved this. In yoga, and so this would have been absolutely prevalent. I'm not going to say absolutely again. Stop me if I say absolutely okay. <laughs> and um, this would have been contemporary with the Buddhist time. The, 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 yoga, the Indian belief is that we are actually uh, layered. So there's the, out, the body would be the most gross layer. And it's called kosha, I believe. And at one time I knew all the words. <laughs> so the, the, the body is... And, and it might be compared with the bark of a tree. And so that would be the most gross level of a human would be the physical, the absolutely physical. Then the yoga teaches that there is an, a less, a, another layer to you, Travis, a feeling level. And they actually say that's where we get sick, right? I mean, like it's the feeling level that it will be where a cold will come in or where a disease will come in. It will come into that feeling level level, which would, would be just a more subtle layer of you. And then the yoga, and this is just plain, I mean, this is just classical yoga. The, the more subtle level or layer is the, what they call the mental, the mental level or layer, which of course would to some extent be the mind. That corresponds completely to what? The three of binding, right? First foundation of mindfulness is the physical. Hello. Second foundation or abiding of, of mindfulness is the feeling tone in your mind, positive, negative, or neutral. If you think, it's quite amazing to think, rather than, Sandy, you're sitting there and saying, well, what is this feeling tone in my mind right now, right? 
I mean, that's one thing, but to start to have this idea that the feeling tone is your is a feeling body, right? I mean, that goes from your feet to the top of your head, right? It's like a more subtle body that maybe someone could even see, maybe a yogi or something. But then there would be the most subtle of that, and the most difficult to experience would be the mental, which would be the third. And as I said last week, that's uh, those of you who were here, Last week, so I said that the third, that, that, that the capacity to truly look back at the mental, you know, and as I remember I said, I noticed one person last week was nodding off. Uh, well, I mean, I was peeping, of course, looking. So one person was nodding and nodding and nodding, and so I had this, uh, as I was watching, you know, I thought, gee, you know, I'm sure that that person is conscious of being sleepy but they weren't, uh, they weren't mindful of it, right? I mean, the mindfulness was not, right? That would be the third foundation, right? I mean, experiencing sleepiness, right? That, I mean, in other words, it's a big deal. And we all know, right? I mean, are we not together here? I mean, how many people have been sleepy while you're sitting, right? Come on, right? I mean, and, and it can be kind of like awful. It can be an awful feeling. I've told people yesterday in Temecula, uh, when we had a retreat, that's, six years ago, where I was talking about sloth and torpor, one of the great hindrances, and at the end of it, we were having a talking circle, and this one person said, she's, and she was sincere, she said, you know, she said, that sloth and torture was awful. <laughs> <laughs> and I loved it, because I thought, absolutely, right? I mean, it was, it was clear, you know, that she heard it as torture rather than torpor. <laughs> it can be torture. I can remember sitting one time... Um, one night, uh, the last sit in a long, long retreat, and my eyes were burning. And I thought, if they, if he doesn't, or she, if they don't ring that bell, I'm gonna get up and ring it for them. Right? I couldn't stand it. But it was really, uh, it was a horrible feeling. How mindful was I? That would be called zero. And I totally knew I was sleepy. I totally didn't want to be sleepy, right? And I wanted to, you know, I wanted to stay there in, in, in grim determination. But, so do you understand how subtle it is? How subtle it is to have the capacity not to be lost in sleepiness and reactive to it, but to have the third foundation or the third body, which is that there's something that's not, that's just watching. What's watching is never sleepy. Do you understand? Mindfulness cannot possibly be sleepy. That's why you can't go to sleep at night if, until the mindfulness slowly ebbs. So anyway, that's the third foundation. It's a very big deal. But I wanted to say again, in terms of the yoga, the layers of our, of what they call the, of the, of, of um, energy, maybe you would say the, the most subtle energy so far would be the third, which would be the mental. So the fourth, is I think absolutely synonymous or uh, analogous with the famous fourth foundation or abiding. And this is the one everyone, I think, uh, I, it's a little bit arrogant in a way, I really do mean that, because, but I, it's never taught this way. I don't understand it, I never understand it. I sat at with a marvelous teacher uh, just a couple months ago, a monastic, been to, I mean, in, Everyone teaches it basically as a kind of a linear, you know, it's just, as I said, it's the fourth pasture. But it's clearly the most subtle. It's clear, I mean, it just follows the whole Hindu Buddhist yoga tradition. In the, in the yoga, it would be called either, uh, it's called different things, but you, some people would refer to it as the spiritual body, right? But it is the most subtle, or the uh, consciousness, bliss, um, I would almost suggest that it's the intuitive wisdom. It's the place where intuition comes up the most subtle. So that's why I said to Brad yesterday, right, that when you're sitting, right, when, when we were sitting in meditation, and suddenly we realize that um, not only do we see, you know, that I'm agitated, but I, I, I realize that I'm really uh, uh, anger, angry. I'm, not that I've ever been angry, and I've never been angry while I'm sitting. 
except those few times when I've been really angry. <laughs> so you're sitting there, right, and you're, you're contemplating, so Travis is saying, you know, I've got to get home and tell Samantha, I, I'm just furious with it. Or, no, you wouldn't do that. Uh, <clears throat> so you sit there, right, and you, you realize that you're mad at Rob. <laughs> You realize that you're angry, and you have this extraordinary moment where you are, as I said, that you're not lost in it. You're observant from that third, from that third, uh, from the mental world. The mental world is extraordinary. I mean, I think most people don't live in the mental world. I think most humans live in the first and a little bit in the second. I don't think that I know it. Living in the th third one would be this uh, I'm going to do a parenthetical okay there was my goddaughter went to the who was visiting went to the this convention downtown and John Maxwell was the kind of like exciting person now I've never heard of John Maxwell does it has anyone ever heard of him there you go <laughs> personal development lord have mercy these people are, <laughs> never mind we'll have to limp can we edit this out of the YouTube? <laughs> All these people, you know, their personal development. But anyway, so he said something that was really good. He said, because she, she, she took notes, he said, people have this idea that they learn from experience. He said, that is ridiculous. So, you know, that's quite a provocative, isn't it? I mean, that people think that they can learn from experience and that's ridiculous. And so I think he had everybody hooked and she said he was quite delightful. She said he was in his 70s. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I thought, well, he's a young guy. So, <laughs> he said, this is really wonderful. He said, people don't learn from experience. You're robbing like this. He said, people learn from being able to evaluate their experience. Mm -hmm. Right? So we all know, right, that experiences, you do it over and over and over and over, right, beat our head against the same wall, and we do it, we repeat, till, you know, some of us repeat till the end of time, and we never have that capacity to evaluate and to learn from the experience. So, I mean, I told my daughter, I said, well, I said, we just talked about that last week, that's called reflection, right, <laughs> reflecting, consciousness reflecting on its present moment experience, which we call mindfulness. So in a sense that's really what he was talking about. That's why I say I do believe that most human beings don't get to that, to, they don't really, I mean they may, I, this sounds so condescending. I mean I really, I'm sorry. My experience is if you look around in the world <laughs> at the at the chaos and the dis, what's going on, one doesn't get the experience that people are much more out of the physical and the and that feeling level, mm -hmm. right? and the living in that mental realm of being able to uh, reflect is pretty rare. So you're sitting there, and so I'm just saying if you were able to really grasp that anger, Raul, or, or no, not grasp it, stand back and look at it from that mindful position which would put you in the mental world, you would be out of the physical and the, and the feeling world, it's very clear to me that you're on a higher plane, and and uh, uh, as well, never mind. I'll say that in a minute. If you had this intuition that came up from God knows where, from wisdom, that's I knew. Oh, I said God knows where. I need to figure it out. If you have this wisdom that came up, that saw that that was a hindrance to your practice which is, the, is one of the lists in the fourth foundation. That brings you into the fourth consciousness realm, beyond the mental realm. As I said, I think the most profound realization, and this one is, I'm gonna say this, nobody's gonna get it. Well, no, I actually think Eric will get it. He's very bright. Eric is, he's a very advanced, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. The ultimate thing is, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, you know, I'm uh, obsessing on Barbara saying something critical about me last week. I'm obsessing on it, right? I can't wait till we get over to the to the cheese over there because I'm going to tell her and I say, you know, uh, 
I don't want you to have any of my pumpkin cheese. <laughs> so I, I'm obsessing. Well, okay, but I, but I process it and I get up to, I say, and I experience it. Oh my goodness, so I'm sitting there and I experience that. This is, this is anger. And the mind is filled with anger. If the intuition came up, and it's almost not a thought by then, because if you're out of the mental, I think you're not really processing even verbally, maybe. I don't know the answer. If you realize, if I realized that I was creating suffering, mm -hmm. that's the most profound insight you can have. The mind is creating suffering. It's the first noble truth, right? I mean, in other words, way beyond the fact that I re remembered that, you know, that there's anger in the mind. But if I experienced, if I had the, the insight uh, that comes up from intuition, this is, this is the first noble truth, the universal truth of suffering. That is the fourth foundation, or the fourth abiding, or the fourth establishment. So that's why I say that, that at, of, at some point, and you, I mean, uh, 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 Ajahn Chah talks about this a lot. You studied the Dharma, and everybody here has been studying the Dharma, some of us for a long time. <clears throat> Eventually you become the Dharma. Eventually you internalize it. It becomes part of what you are. And the other way of putting that is one of my most, I'm really doing well, aren't I? I'm kind of surprised. <laughs> this incredible, this incredible um, Chinese saying, the wise enshrine the miraculous bones of the ancients within themselves. That's an amazing thing. The wise enshrine the miraculous bones of the ancients, which could be the Buddha, within themselves. I mean, we, we, I mean, we actually, you know, it's, in, it's internalized. It becomes part of who we are. That's what I mean, that's the, 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 the same thing as saying that, that we become the Dharma rather than practicing the Dharma at some point. And that would be, that's why I'm saying that the fourth foundation to some extent, or the fourth abiding, is that that's when the Dharma is functioning, right? And so you're beginning to process not only on the physical, on the feeling, and on the mental level, but all of a sudden, and I mean, I know you do it, I know you do it, Brett, all of a sudden you start saying, oh, <laughs> Oh, right. I mean, you you see that you see the Dharma in your life, right? Oh, I mean, if you're walking around and you say, "Oh, I say I'm clinging," that's the fourth foundation. That is not the third. That's not the second. That's not the first. So, so one more thing, and then I will uh, bring this to a, a halt. Uh, the other uh, the other um, sort of analogy that you could use. And by the way, I'm going to just say this again. It's kind of arrogant to be saying this, but I don't care. This is, this is a tremendous minority view, what I'm presenting. Teachers don't present this. You ain't going to, I mean, it's astounding. I don't understand it. I don't. I don't get it. Um, I mentioned this to the teacher that I, as far as, I mean, very diplomatically, and uh, I mean, it was, and he said, oh, he said, he paused, right, and he said, oh, oh, he said, that's pretty, he said, that's very interesting. If you, if you stand on the flat land, right, and you see, of course, everything from that position. If you go up, you know, one-third up the mountain, you see everything below. So the higher you go, then the more, right, the more you see below. And so, in that same way, if you are finally processing on the fourth level, it means automatically that you're processing all of the ones below, right? You're, I mean, you're you're unfolding the, the physical and the, uh, the feeling and the and the mental. But if you're processing on the first, right, only on the bottom level, you ain't going to be processing on the. It doesn't. It's just not possible. So it is a kind of a a, a gradual. Um, development and I and I actually think that's that helps me to understand why ultimately 
it's a process of change, right? I mean, in other words, you can see, right, how, how I mean, if that, if that really is more and more deeply being incorporated into what you really are, right? I mean, into your bones, the miraculous bones are incorporated into your, your bones, uh, then, then you're in trouble. <laughs> you're changing. You're just changing. There's nothing, you know, you could say, well, I really want to do this, but I don't want to change. I remember, uh, I, I, this is one of my favorite memories. It was uh, someone from our sangha. The first long retreat we ever did, well, it was a weekend retreat in this phenomenal home in the, uh, overlook uh, with the, back, the view of the Sierras. She had an indoor swimming pool. We divided up and right we did we had mindfulness to swim in. <laughs> no, it was just wonderful. <laughs> and during the talking circle, I had talked, I had been talking about the idea of that, like if you have the in Buddhism, if you have a, a, a profound experience of it's called stream entry. According to the classical Buddhist, Buddhist you've all heard me tell you, talk about this. Well, you all have it, but according to classical Buddhism, if you have had a, a, a a real profound insight into truth, you can only incarnate seven more, reincarnate seven more lifetimes. Even if you didn't write, you, you're, you're, I mean, you're just, you're out of here in seven. And it could be less, it could be three or one, but, but you're out of here in seven. So this one person raised his hand, it was really sweet, and he, I, I said, yes, he said, well, what if you don't want to go out after seven. I was so surprised. <laughs> I mean, I was so surprised. I didn't, I couldn't understand what he was saying. I, says, I, I said, what do you mean? Right? I, mean I mean, he was clear what he meant, right? I said, I, I don't understand. What, explain that. And he said, oh, and so he tried to do it, and he said it differently, right? And I still didn't understand it. It took me for about 10 minutes. It's really, because I thought, how? how <laughs> But he was very, he said, and he finally said, well, he said, I have no interest in leaving in seven lifetimes. I said, oh, my God, so never mind. <laughs> but uh, that is, um, that is kind of the teaching of, of, is that, that this gradual change, even though it's gradual, it's sort of like a critical mass. I mean, you reach a point where, you're, it's called in the stream. You have entered the stream of the Dharma, even and you may not. I mean, whether you know it or not, you're you're on your way. I like that idea. Okay, so that's all I have to say. <laughs>